What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you my review after 100% for Weird West. Weird West is a very interesting sort of CRPG meets immersive sim. One of the developers is famed for working on the Dishonored series, but the game itself is a very interesting blend of dark fantasy with like occult elements meeting the Wild West, which is a pretty interesting premise by itself. But before we jump into all of that, let me give my regular spiel real quick, and that is that I like to review games after 100% to set me apart from other YouTubers, my Steam profile is public, it is linked in the description below. Feel free to check it out, and while these reviews do include the achievements, they do not include just the achievements. If you're new to the channel and you go to my channel, the first video you're going to see is a video of me explaining everything that is covered. Now that's important to note here because I am relatively sure one of the achievements is actually bugged. So as of right now, I'm actually missing one of them. It's a collection achievement that involves finding three snow globes. I have searched high and low for these things, and the only thing I have been able to find is a reference to the snow globes, but not the globes themselves. And doing a little bit of research, it seems that nobody has this achievement on any platform. And while I have not seen official confirmation that it is bugged, I feel like it probably is. That said, it's a collection thing. It clearly wasn't going to add much to this review anyway. But when it gets fixed or we figure out what the issue is, I'll go snatch it up pretty easy. I've got the save files ready across various points of the game. But from there, let's actually dive into this title. Now, let's talk about the story setup first. I'm not going to be spoiling anything or as little as possible anyways. There might be some footage here and there that shows something that depending on your qualification of what a spoiler is may or may not bother you, but primarily we're looking at early footage and attempting to avoid spoilers. That said, we need to talk a bit about the story setup, if you will. So the setup for this story is that we actually will be playing through five smaller stories that are then kind of connected via a framing device. So throughout the game, we're going to take control of one of five characters. Each of these five characters kind of has their own little individual story going on, and then it's all connected with the broader narrative. There are a few things I want to mention about the story. For starters, I do think the story actually gets really good, but it's a bit of a slow burn on your way there, because the first several stories you're working through seem very disconnected, and you're kind of like, there's clearly something going on here, but I don't know what it is, and it just takes a little long to actually get where you're going. But when you get around to the fourth and the fifth story, things actually start to heat up a little bit, and I think overall it's a very good story, but if you're looking for like quick snappy narrative right at the beginning, it, it takes a little while to get there. And while the first story is honestly probably their strongest one in terms of the five individual characters you'll be playing, the very disconnected nature of the story kind of makes it take a while to get to the point. But from there, let's talk character progression. So we're going to be playing five characters throughout the course of the game. So what does that actually look like? Well, you're not going to be leveling up in the traditional sense. Your progression is down to abilities, perks, and your items. Abilities are kind of character specific. All five of the characters will have access to the same weapon abilities. However, each individual character will then have four special character abilities that are unique to them. Now you unlock abilities by finding nymph relics that are just kind of out in the world. You'll find a ton of them. They are not in short supply. As long as you're looking around, they glow purple, they're pretty easy to find. However, this progress does not carry over to the next story for the most part. Once you move on to the later stories in the game, you can actually go back and recruit your previous heroes as followers, and they kind of work as companions in that way. And depending on the abilities you gave them while you were playing as them, that's what they have access to and what they'll use when you recruit them as your follower or companion or whatever you want to call it. But then we have the perk system. The perks actually do transfer from character to character. They are just broadly what you have. You increase your perks by finding the numerous golden ace of spades that you can just kind of find around. They glow gold. Again, pretty easy to find. There's a lot of them. And increasing your perks has a bunch of very broad things that it will increase, such as your sneak attack damage doing more, allowing you to jump higher, which lets you engage with the freedom of movement on offer much more. There's a lot of options, and again, perks carry on with you. And then we are brought to our items. Item upgrades are divided into a few different things, but primarily weapons as well as your vest. Every character gets one like armor slot, if you will, and it's a vest. You can actually make these by finding pelts from animals in the world. However, you need a skinning tool bag from a tailor in order to gather their pelts, or you can just find them. And in a similar situation with the weapons, you'll find the weapons, of course, but in order to upgrade them from one or just the base level to a four-star weapon, you need various levels of ore, copper, silver, and gold. 
and obviously the gold weapons are the best. No matter what type of weapon you're using, they use ore to upgrade them, so even if you're using a bow, you're still using ore to upgrade it. Now there are bits of five-star equipment, however, I only ever found this in shops, and it is very expensive, so it was usually just easier to steal them from the shops at night if you really want them. And then the last thing I want to talk about when it comes to character progression is how to transfer your stuff to the next story, if you will. All of your items and that character's abilities stay with them. They don't transfer on to your next character. You retain the perks. However, that character might have had items that you wanted to keep. Well, there's a few different ways you can approach that. The most straightforward is probably the bank. You can pay a bank for a safety deposit box, throw all your items into it, and then your next characters can just go to the bank and pick it up. However, you do have two other options. You can buy a horse, which comes with saddlebags. The saddlebags, no matter what horse you're using, are always the same, so essentially the same as the bank, except you can take it with you. And then we have just going and recruiting the person. So as you get to the later stories, you can, of course, just go back and recruit the hero you were just using as a follower. These, in terms of combat efficiency, are usually the best followers, as you might imagine, but doing so will allow you to access their inventory and just take whatever you need from them. So nothing is ever lost. It can just be a bit of a runaround to go get it, which, you know, can be a little annoying, honestly. And from there, let's move on to the world building. Now, as I already mentioned, this is kind of the Wild West meets dark fantasy. There's like occult elements going on in the background. There's a lot of dark magic, that type of stuff. And as a setting, I think that's really unique. I can't say I've ever played played anything quite like it. Now, functionally, it works like basically every CRPG you've ever played. There's a world map, you travel between locations, and then your actual gameplay takes place in those smaller maps. But this is where the game gets fun, because you have options for days in terms of what you can do. You can wipe out whole towns, you can kill story characters, and because of this broader narrative, everything kind of makes sense and still works. There's always a way to continue the narrative. And like I said, you can wipe out entire towns, and if you do, It'll turn into a ghost town for a while, enemies will move in, but over time it will eventually become repopulated. So if you want to be the biggest terror the West has ever known, you can absolutely be that person. There's a very well-implemented crime system, actually. So obviously if somebody catches you stealing or something, they'll be like, hey pal, you can go to jail or you can fight. So that's a thing. However, let's say you kill somebody. If locals saw you come into town and then you kill somebody and just leave, they're going to know that it was you, because you're the only stranger that was in town, and then this murder happened. So you still take the uh, bounty, if you will, which is a hit to your reputation, which affects shop prices, etc., as well as companions or followers you can take on. So if you want to get away with crime, you actually need to go into town and make sure nobody sees you, especially if you're doing something like murdering someone. And to add a bit of a layer to it, there's actually a bounty system where you can go collect bounties on all these other characters. Now, this is mostly a radiant system. However, there is a little bit of structure to it. For starters, bounties are the best way to make money. They will give you hundreds of dollars, whereas everything else sells for like 10 to 20 usually. Very great way to make money, which allows you to buy things like horses, your bank deposit box, etc. But as I mentioned, the bounties are mostly radiant, meaning that they will send you to locations every so often. There's an enemy type that will kind of dictate what that map looks like, but the maps themselves of the mines and things they tend to send you to have like almost identical layouts. But where they send you to is almost always a side area. Everywhere in the main path had unique locations and layouts and everything, but I noticed for the bounties in particular, they put the bounties in mines and places like that, etc., which are side areas, but they all kind of reused the same map. So if you go to a mine, it's going to be the same mine for every one of these bounties, which was a little annoying. But in addition to the radian part of it, if you, as part of your story-related stuff, happen to let a villain get away in some manner, they pretty much always then become a bounty that you can take on, and those bounties have a bit more structure to them than the more traditional radiant ones, which are most of them. So I thought that was a nice touch. But beyond that, as I mentioned, there's a banking system, which is always kind of nice. You can actually sell uh, ore and everything that you find. If you don't want to use it to upgrade your weapons, you can turn it into bars and sell it to the bank for money. You can, of course, interact with the actual bank. I was kind of disappointed they didn't give you a loan option. That would have been fun. I think they could have worked that in with the crime system, but I didn't see one. But in addition to all that stuff, then we have the dark fantasy aspect of it, right? There's cults. There actually seems to be basically two cults that are kind of opposing each other. There's the Fire Nation, which is the Native Americans of this particular game, which are actually based on a very specific Native American tribe that the game tells you about. And honestly, it just feels like a world, you know? As you're doing things, the world around you is reacting to it. Are you committing crimes, etc.? How are you approaching things? Are you killing main characters? 
the story goes on anyway. And one thing I actually did enjoy in this regard is that there's a body detection, if you will, on enemies, but we'll talk a bit more about that here in just a minute because it's both good and bad, but I'm going to tell you about the good part right now, and then we'll talk about the bad part during combat, which is the next section. But the good part is if you kill someone and you leave their body, or if someone even just dies in a way that had nothing to do with you, NPCs will react to that. It sets them on alert, they go looking for enemies, etc. If you've committed a crime and that's why the body's there, then, you know, obviously that sparks interest from law enforcement, etc. So there's reactions to those things. But there's a bad part of that, which we're about to get to. Which brings us to the combat section. Combat is chaotic, unpredictable in many cases, but it's also a lot of fun. However, it does have some major flaws, as I've already alluded to. But first, the good things. It's very interactive. You know, you can shoot oil lamps, barrels, etc. that will cause explosions, set things on fire. You can then use that fire to your advantage. Anything you throw in that fire is going to catch on fire. You can use that fire to light your arrows by walking by it. Sometimes the environment will spawn a tornado that goes by. You can use fires, etc. to add elemental damage to that tornado, which will then whip people up. There's a stealth system. There's a remarkable amount of freedom of movement. You know, you're free to jump and everything. There's actually a perk that increases how much you can jump so you can get on top of buildings. You can kind of parkour, for lack of a better word, kind of across certain maps. And there are so many really fun options to approach combat with that honestly, it's usually more fun to see how things play out rather than reload to fix a mistake. So if you get caught during stealth or something, a lot of times the ensuing chaotic battle that follows is usually better than just reloading the game. But from there, let's talk about some of the negatives of combat. So first and foremost, the controls. They take some getting used to. I played on keyboard and mouse, so I don't think it was as bad for me. But you essentially right click to aim whatever weapon you're wielding. And then the mouse at that point takes care of the aiming. So that'll bring up this line and then your mouse movements kind of aim the line for you and then you have to left click to actually use the weapon which honestly is super standard but I found that it took some getting used to to kind of work with that system effectively because when you're aiming a weapon the camera kind of stops wanting to move for you which can cause the camera to kind of be at a bad angle and cause you a lot of problems and makes it honestly feel a little more janky than it should be. And again, on keyboard and mouse, this is mostly a familiarity issue like after I played with it for a while I got used to it and it was okay. I have heard reports from people playing on a controller that that is actually much worse because they actually use both the joysticks to move it around, which sounds awful, honestly. But I will say for the melee weapons in particular, having to aim your melee weapon before you can just swing it felt very strange. Because with melee weapons, there's no exception. You still have to right click to aim the weapon before you can actually use it in combat, which just felt odd. And then from there, let's talk about the problems with stealth. This primarily, in my opinion, boils down to the body detection, or at least part of that system anyways. So the most glaring issue with stealth that I noticed is that when you knock someone out, because you can sneak up behind a character and knock them out silently, which is great, there's a stealth option. However, you then have to hide that body, because as I mentioned, if someone else sees it, that's going to alert them. They're going to know someone's there, so you're going to want to hide those bodies. You can hide them in grass and things, and in theory, the game shows you when that body shouldn't be detected. There's a little eye with a slash through it indicating that no one can see it. However, that does not work. If an enemy walks anywhere near that body in their line of sight, they're going to spot it anyway, no matter where you hit it. Which means the only effective way to hide bodies is to go throw them somewhere on the map where the enemies just aren't. Which frankly gets pretty annoying pretty quickly, to the point where I usually started out with stealth to see how many people I could take out of the fight before the fight actually started, but actually trying to take a more stealthy approach and make sure nobody sees bodies, etc., was usually a waste of time because you can't hide the bodies effectively because apparently every enemy has x-ray vision. Which brings me to my next problem with the stealth system, and that is that they tried to implement a noise system and I don't think it worked very well because this actually happens while you're not in stealth, but you know, you're hiding, I guess would say, which is why I mentioned it as a stealth problem. Enemies can hear and it feels like they can see you through walls. So if an enemy is on the other side of a wall, if you get too close to that enemy on the opposite side of the wall, you're going to create a noise and you're actually going to see a circle, if you will, kind of pop up under you, which I believe is supposed to be a noise indicator. But literally by the time you see that, it's too late. The enemy is instantly alerted and they come running around the wall to find you, which feels ridiculous because it's like, obviously, even if that person heard a noise, they had no idea of knowing if it was you, but they instantly go to alerted and 
attack mode. They don't go into investigative mode where they go check it out like they would with a dead body. They jump straight to guns blazing, which feels ridiculous. So while the stealth system is mostly fun, it's a bit of a mixed bag because of the very specific problems I just mentioned. But disregarding those, the combat itself, again, it's chaotic, it's unpredictable, it's a lot of fun. Each character that you're playing has four unique abilities, and if you kind of lean into that and focus on getting those unique abilities, you can vary up the gameplay a great deal. To where, again, half the time, even if I got caught when I was trying to sneak around, it was just more fun to see how it played out than it was to reload. And there was only one or two fights where it really felt like a chore. And the places it felt like a chore was primarily because I didn't have any equipment on me, because the game had just switched characters on me and I had to go get my equipment. And while, again, there are methods of doing that, it's just kind of annoying to have to go do it when you built up a character already. Now, this game doesn't really have companions, but as I mentioned a couple times, you can go recruit your previous heroes. But truthfully, I would actually recommend you not do that. Not because they're not good or anything. The previous journey heroes, as they're called, are honestly the best followers you can get, and in terms of combat effectiveness, they are the best. However, each character that you're playing through, their story will usually come with a couple of unique followers that I think add a little more context and information to their story. So I find it's usually more fun to take on those followers than it is to use the previous journey heroes, even though they are more combat effective. So just a little food for thought there. But your companions, if you will, or the closest you're going to get to that outside of like closer to mercenaries are your actual characters that you've been playing. But then, as I mentioned, there are a couple of followers that get kind of just a small little aside that go along with the character you're playing, though it's not very in-depth in any capacity. And then if you don't want to do any of that, you can actually hire uh, mercs, for lack of a better word, hire gunslingers, I guess, in this case, from saloons, etc. Depending on your reputation, you'll have access to various types of mercs, which can be hired on and they can serve as followers for you. And honestly, they're pretty disposable as they have no story or anything. But there is permadeath if any of your followers, etc. die. They are just dead. So that's something to keep in mind. So from there, let's talk positives, negatives, and wrap this thing up. On the positive sides of things, tons of choices. It feels like a really lived-in world, like the world is reacting to what you're doing. It feels like a world, and that immersive sim aspect of it, they kind of nailed. Outside of a few things, it honestly just feels really cool to interact with the world. In addition to that, the setting is very unique. I can't say I've ever quite played anything that's like Wild West fantasy like this, especially with all the, like the really dark occult elements to it, and I thought that was really cool. Now, for me, the negatives were largely reacquiring progress as you switch characters. Again, yes, there are methods to do so, but it's very annoying because on your way to go reacquire that progress via the bank, your horse, or whatever, you're usually going to run into random encounters that, quite frankly, you just are not equipped for, which gets annoying. And then beyond that, the problems with the camera, one thing I didn't actually mention, but I'll mention it now, is in addition to it being kind of clunky to move in combat, it's a sort of layered camera, so you can't actually see in a building unless you're like aiming inside of a window or something. And oftentimes it can be very hard to get a good view of things if there's more than one layer or level, like a two-story house or something. It can be very hard to just see what you're doing, which I suppose is immersive, but for a top-down game can be very frustrating. And then another negative are the issues with the stealth system that I mentioned, and lastly, the map reuse. As I mentioned, several of the maps for like mines and things just reuse the same map layout and depending on the enemy type that's currently there they'll kind of change the interior but that's about it. So for a conclusion I would say it's a very fun game that is just shy of being an incredible game. It has a couple problems but it was so close to just being a really mind-blowing game but unfortunately a few of its issues kind of get in the way and it stumbles here or there. But that said, I hope this does very well for the developer and they get the chance to make more or even put out some DLC, etc. Because I'm very interested to see what they do with this IP next because this has been a blast to play for me personally. So when it comes down to a recommendation, let's talk about it. So right now it's actually on Xbox Game Pass. So if you have that, you can play it for free. So hard not to recommend that. If you go through Steam, it is $40. For me personally... I think $40 is a good price for this game. I had a lot of fun for 40 bucks. For some people, the fact that only the main narrator is voice acted, all the other problems I mentioned with stealth, the camera, the controls, that's a bit of a deal breaker for a lot of people. 
So while for, again, me personally, I think $40 is well worth it, I would say if you specifically are annoyed by any of the issues I just mentioned, then you probably want to wait for a sale. But I personally do think it is worth $40 as I had a blast with this game. It was a lot of fun. But that said, it's almost like this game was marketed for me in my channel because this is like exactly the kind of game that I'm into. So really cool to see. But there you go, guys, my full review of Weird West. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, by all means, leave a like, comment, subscribe. Let me know how you feel about the title down below. But regardless of any of that, truly, thank you so much for watching. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.